I first learned about civic coffee about, I don't know, about three years ago, I think. And I was kind of shocked. First of all, it sounded horrible. Uh, drinking coffee from beans that have been through the digestive system and pooed out by a civet. Um, and then I learned more about it. And originally it was wild civets and people collected it from the forest. And as civets like coffee cherries, then that seemed okay. But then, of course, as demand grew, the exploitation began. It's obscene. They're one of the most ancient families of carnivals to walk the planet, but they do so in almost complete secrecy. Civets are solitary, they're nocturnal, which makes them really tricky to observe in the wild, even though they are widely distributed across Asia and Africa. There's about 35 species, though no one really knows um, how many there are, because we have so little information on their genetics. And anatomically, they're just amazing. There is so much variation between each civet species. Mostly though, when I think of civets, I think of their curious little faces and their big, bright eyes. A uh, civet is a fluffy, fluffy cute, cat-like animal, a very gentle animal and they move very quietly and slowly, and it will melt your heart when you see her eyes. Civet are important for Vietnam for the economic environment and also the control as well. I think they deserve attention and love from people. Civet is uh, yeah, one of the really important species for the ecosystem. You know, like civets eat the uh, control some of small animals, so that is uh, really make balance for the ecosystem. They also eat eating the fruits, so they spread the seed to many different places. So it's contribute for like the growth of the forest. So without the civets, it's I think the big loss for the ecosystem. Civet coffee is coffee that's been produced through the digestive tract of the civet. So they have a very specialised digestive tract, which is said to produce a very unique flavoured coffee because the digestive enzymes are said to alter the structural and the chemical characteristics of the coffee. So when it's then excreted out in their faeces, um, you have a superior coffee we see that civet coffee started to become um, more popular just after 2007. And that's because it was featured in a very famous Hollywood film at the time. Um, and then it also was featured on some rather mainstream Western television shows. And so suddenly consumers were baffled by this product. Some were curious, some were disgusted. Um, everyone wanted to try it. So civet coffee is said to be the most expensive coffee in the world because it's meant to be the rarest coffee in the world. So the civet coffee industry would say that it's about 127 kilograms availability per year in the world. And the reason they say it's really rare is because the marketing claim is that farmers are going out into the fields, uh, into the forest, and they are finding the civet feces. They then collect the feces, they'll pick the coffee beans and then they clean those beans, they dry them, they roast them the same that you would with normal coffee. But it's, it's not really rare because what's actually happening is they are caging civets en masse. 
and that's happening throughout Southeast Asia. In reality, there are hundreds of thousands of civets across Asia that are being force-fed coffee in confinement. And so they're producing civet coffee on mass scale. The civet coffee industry is predicted to reach an annual net worth of 10.9 billion US dollars. Yet little research has been done to see what the impacts of this rapidly growing industry might be. And what little research has been done has focused on Indonesia. So this is why we wanted to head to Vietnam. Vietnam is a really interesting place to study civet coffee because it's really important for biodiversity. But also, Vietnam's civet coffee industry is still developing. And so we're still trying to understand the wider implications for conservation, animal welfare and public health. To see how civet coffee is marketed to city tourists, we started our journey in Hanoi. We decided to visit cafes and stores selling civet coffee, and we also spoke to the tourists visiting them. Tourism is not only about leisure travel and vacationing. Tourism includes all different types of travel motivations, and all of it around the world encompasses an enormous economic driver. The product in the tourism industry is the experience. And when tourists make decisions about their experiences that they're going to purchase, they're making a decision that it affects the entire supply chain. We found that tourists tended to have very little understanding of civic coffee trade beyond the surface level marketing, that civic coffee is pooped by an animal. If you're planning a trip that clearly has some animal tourism element in it. Do a bit of research before you actually accept that you're, you are going to participate. Because obviously, if you are part of the audience, you're only encouraging what might not be a good welfare situation. As individuals, like as the tourists ourselves, when we're traveling, I think the onus is on us to think critically about what we're consuming. I don't just mean consuming as in drinking coffee, but in any way, whenever we're interacting with wildlife, we should be reading up in advance. What is it actually? You know, if I'm about to interact or benefit from a wild animal in, in any way at all, whether that's coffee or riding an elephant or seeing a wild animal in captivity, what has that animal gone through to give me the end product? And coffee, civet coffee, coffee luwak is the same. It's really the same. People don't know. To understand if civic coffee is part of Vietnamese culture, we went to the National University of Economics. I don't think that normal average um, citizen or normal average household will buy the civic coffee at home and drink and consume it. I don't think that. <laughs> Normally, there's people going on a trip or on a tour or tourists with a high spending. They will try. Yeah. We often uh, take the case study of mass tourism as the most damaging activity of tourism uh, to um, the environment. Maybe it's not done uh, uh, greatly, but uh, um, they just don't know uh, that they're doing something harmful to the environment. Civic coffee was really popular in the main tourist hub of Hanoi. Coffee shops were everywhere and each shop had row upon row of civic coffee available. But each shop had more civic coffee on display than the industry claims is available per year in the entire world. From the stores and the cafes that we visited, there was a lot of patchy information, but there was one key fact that was always consistent, and that was that civic coffee was not produced in Hanoi. All sources pointed instead to another area of Vietnam, Dalat. We were really interested in visiting Dalat because it's an area of Vietnam well known for its tourism. We also weren't really surprised when coffee shop owners in Hanoi were telling us to go to Dalat. We were already aware that Dalat was one of the central regions in Vietnam 
for civic coffee production. Dilat was a prime area of interest for our visit because we wanted to see the impact of tourism on civic coffee demand. We knew that civic coffee tours were happening in Dilat, but also we were aware that there was a much deeper and more insidious trade of civets happening throughout that region. So there was a key piece of research and that was conducted by Save Vietnam's Wildlife. And the lead researcher on that paper was Mai Trinh. And Mai is one of the trustees of the Civic Project Foundation. It's hard to say when, but uh, based on the research work that we do, um, the Civic Coffee seemed to pick uh, and Civic Farm seemed to pick from 2005 and 2010. Uh, we, uh, we conduct some visit to 57 civet farms in two provinces in the central highlands. We chatted with the farm owners and, and observed how they practice raising the civets in their farm and to check uh, how the, what is the impact of um, civet farming to the civet wild population and also how it could spread the like, link with the biosecurity or like zoonotic disease. Uh, in, in the end, we we've really found the uh, very <laughs> astonishing answers to the question, yeah. Their research showed that the conditions in civic coffee farms couldn't meet even the most basic of civet needs. Farms were often over capacity. Some of them housed several hundred civets each. Many of those civets they didn't have permits for. So we knew that civets were being taken from the wild in alarming numbers. Another issue was that biosecurity was completely lacking for all of those facilities. And so civet coffee farming was a huge cause for concern when it came to zoonotic disease. Unfortunately, from what we found, the situation is still very much the same. Although we've been researching civic coffee production and civic coffee tourism for a number of years, it was really still very shocking to see the amount of suffering that this industry was causing. All bar one of the farms we visited had a very, very similar setup, which was very small cages which housed one civet each. Every single civet we observed had some sort of either behavioural issues such as pacing or self-mutilation, which are all really significant signs of stress. There were signs that they had previously been housed together, and so several were missing chunks of their ears. There were high rates of malnourishment, which was to be expected, given that these animals are rarely fed anything but coffee. But there were also cases of obesity, where the animals had refused to, to eat the coffee and so were starving. And so then, in those cases, the farm owners would give them chicken broth or different types of very high sugar fruit, which caused obesity, and still they would refuse to, to eat the coffee. All farms that we visited had disease concerns. There was no sign of biosecurity. So civets were often sat in their own feces. We had cases where urine was running across the floor. We had cases of domestic animals, all within a very, very close proximity to these civets that were coming from the wild, from all different areas of Vietnam, potentially. And so we had a huge amount of opportunity for disease to spread. No thought given to the health of the workers that were going to be engaging with these animals, and certainly no thought as to the number of tourists that could possibly pick up disease and infection. The interactions that people are having in these tourist facilities with wildlife puts them at direct risk from zoonotic disease, but it also places the animals at risk. You think how many tourists are coming from all over the world 
A simple cold to one tourist could be a death sentence to one of these animals. Facilities were also very aware of uh, the tourist's desire to interact with animals and to have photographs of those interactions. So there were many cases where animals were used as nothing more than photo props for tourists to pose with. Zoonotic diseases can be spread between wildlife and humans. They often have a reservoir in wildlife. These are diseases like rabies that can spill over to humans or Ebola that can spill over to humans. And most recently, things like um, COVID-19. And civets are an animal that can carry zoonotic diseases. Um, they've been known to carry some that have jumped over to humans. The SARS epidemic is a key example. And because of that, we should be very careful about regulating how people interact with civets. So whenever you take civets from the wild where they might have these diseases and bring them in close contact with humans, whether it's for wild meat trade or for civet coffee, you're going to have a potential for zoonotic disease spillover. One facility we visited had a walkthrough exhibit. And in that same facility, we saw a civet that was so ill with what looked to be symptoms of parvovirus that this animal looked like it was already dead. And we were free to touch everything in that enclosure that the animal had come in contact with. It was evidently clear in every single facility that we visited that civic coffee tourism has huge implications for human health. In several of the tours we visited, we also saw binturong, but binturong are listed as vulnerable to extinction on the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, and so this species is not permitted to be housed for civic coffee. But when we spoke to the tour guides, we were told that binturongs were highly desirable for civic coffee production, specifically because they are larger than the palm civets, and so they could consume more, and they could then produce more. All of the farms we visited had signs that civets were being regularly captured from the wild. We saw snare injuries, including missing feet and open bloody wounds. In all cases, it was clear these civets were newly captured because their injuries were fresh. Capturing civets in the wild to replace those that are dying in civet coffee farms and tours has huge implications for conservation. Not only does it mean that we're constantly seeing civets removed from their natural habitat, where they are serving a role for the ecosystem as seed dispersers and seed germinators, but we're seeing huge numbers of snares being placed into the environment, simply in the hope that they catch civets. Snares are by nature indiscriminate. They're cruel, because you don't know what's going to be walking through that snare. You don't know what species you're going to catch. And for every single civet that you might collect, how many other animals, how many other species have been caught in, in, in those traps? Indiscriminate snaring has been labelled by conservation scientists as an epidemic in Vietnam. We managed to get the contact details of two civet farm owners. Both told us that they could produce as much as 150 tonnes of civet coffee from a network of farms operating privately in the region. When we made contact with each of these owners, we did so under the guise of being international coffee traders. We asked them, firstly, if they could prove that they had the number of civets that would be required to create the many tonnes of civet coffee that they were claiming to be able to produce per year. Not only did the civet coffee owners respond to our request for further information, but they also sent through videos promoting the conditions of which they housed their civets. So, so this is the first farm where they said they could produce 150 yes, tonnes? Yes. And I asked her for more photos of uh, the civet farms. 
They are connected to all the secret funds around Dada City. And this is the condition, the close up condition of this farm. So this is the same farm that had 50 civets in that massive open air. Yes. Well, I say massive. Yes. And they it's... told us that the farm is like half wildlife, so the civet can have the best condition. But there's no evidence there of any other food. So we have a footage of the sign yes. on that farm yes. that says to the tourists yes. that there's this really strict feeding regime. And actually, this is the reality. This is the reality. I think this is what they don't want us to see. So what this means is that for every civet we saw in these tourism facilities, there was 10, 20, 30 more that were in much, much worse conditions that weren't being shown to the tourists. Whilst we were doing our undercover investigation, we were made aware of an associated industry, which was the sale of civets for their meat. In following those leads, we found an entire industry hidden in plain sight. Within an hour, we had found about 25 Facebook groups, all of which were dedicated to civet trade, uh, and combined there was more than 145,000 active members. When we got access to, to those groups claiming that we wanted to buy civets, we were offered wild-caught civets of various uh, species, including those that are listed as endangered. And all of those were traded for meat and for civet coffee. So this is really when it became clear that the civet coffee industry goes beyond coffee. It's linked to an entire network of animal trafficking. we desperately wanted to find the light at the end of the tunnel. We wanted to meet people working on the ground, protecting civets and their habitats. And so, we travelled to Cuc Phuong National Park to meet Save Vietnam's wildlife. So, Save Vietnam Wildlife is a um, uh, local non-profit organisation in Vietnam. So, we work to stop the extinction and champion recovery of threatened species in Vietnam. So our work is more focused on first is the rescue animals from illegal wildlife trade, taking care of them and they learn, return them back to the wild. The second is we're doing the research in the field, understand the, how the chain of the population uh, finding the rare and important species. We also it working to protect the habitats. So both like inside we go to the patch remove snare, confiscate the um, poacher, arrest the poacher. Uh, outside, we work to improve law enforcement and also it's the rail awareness chain behavior. We're also working with the Vietnamese government to uh, change the policy and make sure the policy is uh, uh, support for wildlife conservation in the country. One of the biggest threats to wildlife in the forest now is the the snare traps. Now from 2018, uh, we established the anthropology team. And then after three years working in the one national park in the central Vietnam, so we collected over 10,000 traps, 10,000 traps in the forest. But, uh, we focus on the group of the civets, like Binturong, Mark Palm civets, Common Palm civets, Austin civets, Often it's one of the most beautiful animals, but uh, because the people often hunt them for the meat consumption and farming. Many places in Vietnam, the Austin is already local extinct. Uh, so, so Vietnam while like working first to rescue animals from illegal chase, develop the conservation breeding program, and we, we hope in the future we can recover uh, the Austin civets in the wild in some of the places they already missing. There's always hope, and we must never, ever give up. We've seen that with the bear bile industry at its height. 
4,000 bears on farms in Vietnam, over 4,000 bears on farms in Vietnam, and we're now, within a handful of years, are going to end the industry. There's always hope and we must not give up. Make no mistake, the road is long, but it has to start somewhere and it can start with us and it can start right now. It's better that we start now and we address it now because in five years, 10 years, 15 years, we'll be saying that we're ending the civet coffee farming industry. There's always hope. If I could give um, advice to the tourists, I would like to say um, come to Vietnam, but not try to the silver coffee. There's so much more interesting and important cultural experience that you could try rather than just try something very tourist driven. If people hear about these things and want to try them, I would advise them first to really check and see what's behind this intriguing sounding substance. But it's pretty hard to investigate a supply chain unless you're prepared to go to the country, spend a lot of time and do some undercover work. So from every aspect, I think civic coffee should be a no-no. Don't drink, don't buy the civet coffee. It's a way to protect the animal and the way to improve the animal welfare and make sure animal is not like bring life from the beautiful nature into the small case and keep forfeit them. So this is our last day in Vietnam and we're reflecting on how the trip has been. One of the take home messages that has come from all of our interviews with different professionals is that tourists are central to the civic coffee trade and the civic coffee trade is central to animal exploitation. Now, one thing that our trip has highlighted is that there are lots of people working on the ground in different NGOs and different rescue, rehabilitation and release facilities that are doing wonderful, wonderful work to try and combat these industries. But it's a drop in the ocean and everyone needs to play their part. This means you as the tourist, this means social media, this means tour operators. Everyone has a responsibility to make sure that this type of industry doesn't last. It's all well and good knowing to avoid a product or a tourist attraction if you are aware of the harms involved, but many tourists don't know. Only by being transparent about the impact of civic coffee upon animal welfare, conservation and public health can tourists know to avoid this practice to begin with. That's why we're calling on TripAdvisor, the largest review site in the world, to formally label all civet coffee attractions that feature live animals as in breach of their own animal welfare policy. There are three key ways that you can help civets. Sign our petition, telling TripAdvisor to add an animal welfare warning to all civet coffee attractions. Speak up. If you see signs of poor animal welfare when you're traveling, please report it. Speak to your travel agent, leave a negative review. Reviews help to inform others. And most importantly, boycott civet coffee.